system that I believe is very similar to the Quill uh, that uh, is, it involves if somebody wants to become a member or if someone wants a friend to become a member, they have to propose them. And then that, uh, that proposal has to get a certain number of backers. And if somebody decides they don't want that person to be a member, they can block. And if somebody blocks, that essentially means that two more supporters need to come on to essentially overcome that block. And the whole process works in reverse as well. So if somebody becomes a problem for whatever reason, they can be proposed to be removed uh, or to be even banned in the most extreme circumstances. And there have been a couple of people that have had to have been banned. Um, and again, that requires a certain number of people to propose that ban. And then a certain, you know, if someone blocks the ban, then more ban supporters have to overcome that. So that's a way to show that there's some support in the community to either have that person or to remove that person. And it gives the members a say in who's part of it. So it's not just anybody with $10 can come through the door and, and be a part of the community. So dealing with the interpersonal relationships and conflicts, I think, is probably one of the most difficult parts. Oh, people. <laughs> So one of the ways that we've dealt with it is we don't have memberships. We have events and hours, and you can show up or not show up. And we also don't pretend to be a democracy. And if if you are offensive or creating a problem for other people, then we'll just ask you to leave. And Kevin will ask you nicely, and then I'll show you the door. <laughs> but on the other hand, I should also say that I cannot express enough how happy and grateful and thankful I was when we did need to close down the last place and move out. We had, how many people do we have, Kevin? Like 50 people? Easy. Easily 50 people showed up with pickup trucks and trailers and, you know, some people who couldn't lift heavy things helped us box stuff up. And we cleared out 4,500 square feet completely. We left it way better than we found it. And I mean, we took out all the walls we put up Everything, every light fixture that we added, we took back out again and we left that place clean, mopped, and bare to the point that when the landlord came in and did the inspection, he's like, where's all the stuff? Where'd you guys put all the stuff? And we're like, it wasn't your stuff, man. <laughs> um, and uh, he's, he was genuinely dismayed that somehow or another, even though we were having to move along, he didn't get to have all the improvements that we made to the place. So, People are fantastic, but one of our approaches has just been that you're not a member, you're here for this thing. And uh, you know, if, if this isn't your vibe and this isn't your thing, then maybe you shouldn't be here for this thing. Um, so you don't have to be uh, uh, an extrovert with good people skills to open a Liberty Club, but you need to partner with someone who does. Uh, and I did that correctly at the very least. Um, it helps to have someone who has experience as both a mediator and a bouncer living upstairs. Uh, that's kind of handy. Um, I would say don't rush into complex policies because libertarians like to game systems. Um, we launched in October of 2010. We didn't really have a formal policy system in terms of, of gaining membership until April 2012. Um, at that time, we implemented our first really simple system and also increased the prices. And uh, we noticed that problems tended to uh, be reduced after that point. Um, and that was pretty good. We released a second version of the policies just a few months ago, which adds a little bit more formality, a little bit more sophistication, which I think makes sense for us because we're, we're trying to scale and we're also going to be using software to do it. And um, so we'll have the tools to, to express um, more complex data structure in terms of like how you vouch for people and how you track that stuff. But I definitely wouldn't rush into it. Um, we definitely are built on a foundation of property rights. Uh, although we haven't been profitable, we've always tried to run it as if it was a for-profit business that had two clear owners. And while we don't like to step in with the fiat hammer very often, and we'll go to great lengths to avoid it, that is ultimately the foundation that you've built on, right? The um, the, the membership and, and, and what happens, it's all based on, on a benevolent dictatorship of, of the property rights owner. And, and you should not forget that. I don't recommend trying to divorce anything like that from the concept of ownership. Don't try to make it an organization with a board. Don't try to make it a nonprofit. Just own it. Um, and do the best you can with it.
Yeah, that's all. That's good stuff. Um, I say, as far as um, lessons I, uh, we learned the hard way, uh, I, I touched on um, straining friendships. Um, it's it's a really hard process, even with someone that people that you know very well, um, to get any big project off the ground. Uh, so just be cognizant that you're going to be presumably working with people that are very close to you personally and ideologically, and you have to put it through an extra effort to make sure that uh, you, you preserve those relationships as the process goes on. Um, and then as far as managing people, we've, we've taken a very cautious approach. Um, we, we sort of have a freemium model where um, we have a very limited uh, set of members, and then they are welcome to have as many guests as they want and host events. So people, we, the space is open for the community, but our membership, are, we want to be people that we know, that we have a track record with, and we actually, we, we are, as far as our pricing, uh, we did keep in mind that we did want it to be a little bit of a, of a barrier just to, to be like, okay, we're only gonna have people who are very serious, because we are giving them, we, we are open 24 seven, we give them the keys to the kingdom, and once you're, once you're a member, you really are, uh, for all intents and purposes, you know, a, a, a stakeholder in the space, and we want that to be. Um, we want you. We want to trust you to, to just do what improve the space and, and make it make it your own in a lot of ways. And that's so far that's worked out um, very well, and we're pleased with that. And I think we've avoided and learned learned from experience from the other clubs and avoided some of the, the big traumas that we could have uh, we could have encountered. Um, Okay, and just as a reminder, you know, if, if there's any anything you want clarification on, feel free to, to raise those hands and jump in. Uh, again, we'll have a, we'll have Q and A at the end. <laughs> oh, we have a question, Kevin. Yes, I just wanted to ask. Uh, Kurt, it's a this is a leading question, but really, yeah, you came up with I know it's that, uh, at the old ter at the old area twenty three you didn't want to, to uh, be in blatant violation of liquor laws, so uh, you came up with a system. <laughs> that uh, was actually where people just contributed, made contributions or donations, but it was at, sort of at random. How did that work out for you? Worked out really well. <laughs> um, one of the things about uh, the old place, we were not licensed and we didn't ask for any permissions to open up, um, which eventually caused us some problems because we were also not really a private space. Um, we have people coming in, not just from the porcupine community, but all kinds of different communities. But, so we also had to be very careful how we could have things like a bar, which people seem to really enjoy, and not overtly break the liquor laws. So we just had a donation jar. And what we actually found out was, is that there were a few people who would kind of game that system a little bit, pay you a little bit less for uh, for a beer poured on draft than, uh, than you otherwise wish you'd gotten. But then other people were extremely generous and really enjoyed having the space that we had and, and liked hanging out there. And they generally made up the difference. Um, we also used scale in that if we poured somebody a beer and they happened to donate a dollar, then the next time we poured them a beer, maybe it was only half full. And then <laughs> they eventually got the message. <laughs> so, does that does that answer your question? <laughs> so, we also did things like having uh, having poker. We never said we're having a poker night. We always just said we're having games of skill, because games of skill are not defined as gambling other than under. under Um, describe a typical week of activities at your space. Uh, so there are regular uh, activist meetings that happen there. There's a members meeting for the King and Keen Activist Center where members meet on a weekly basis with uh, the management. 
uh, to go over whatever kind of issues might have arisen over the last week, if there's any uh, proposals for new members and things like that, sort of doing the, the business, if you will, of the, the Keen Activist Center. Uh, we have Sundergize on Sundays uh, at 4 o'clock, which is a time for activists to come together. And those who can't physically come to the space, we have teleconference ability, so people can join a Google Hangout and uh, you know, basically go over what happened in the last week, you know, what court cases or activist projects uh, were going on, what's coming up, you know, what are the upcoming things that people can do, and sort of to try to get everybody on the same page. There's a, a Google document that people can have access to that has all those notes in it. Um, so we try to make that accessible to people physically at the club and those who you know, can't, for whatever reason, they're stuck at home or just don't feel like leaving, they can join as well. Um, so those are some of the things that happen on the weekends there. They're frequently our karaoke nights. They're, they used to be every week. Yeah, they're not as frequent uh, these days, but they still happen. There was one uh, that happened last week. And sort of like what you were saying, if a member of the, the club wants to have something there, they can do that. They're also responsible for the cleanup as well. So if you want to have a meeting, uh, then you've got to clean up that space when you're done. If you're bringing guests in, then you're responsible for, I mean, hopefully the guests will clean up their own mess, but if not, that's your responsibility as, uh, as the member. And so, you know, a variety of things can happen. Sometimes it's someone's cooking. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, like a NH uh, jury board meeting uh, that might happen. So it's hard to really describe what a typical week is because each uh, you know member can sort of create whatever they want. So there you go. Well, since we closed the old space and haven't quite opened the new space, um, it's a, it's an interesting question for me. But some of you guys who were at the old space remember that I mean, there were definitely days that where we would have one event going on in the uh, in the hall with the stage that might involve music. There were people in the back bar area smoking and drinking. There might be another class going on in the kitchen area where somebody was learning to can or make biltong or something like that. And then we had the front area where maybe there was a big game of D&D or Axis and Allies and there was another room where people were doing yoga and then there was a hydroponics class going on at the same time. We just did all kinds of things. Except when we weren't doing anything. Some days we didn't do much of anything there. Um, one thing that I will say is that Kevin and I figured out pretty quickly that you have to have business meetings, and business meetings suck. So, you make them less sucky by having them on Mondays, and you bring your Cuban cigars and a bottle of bourbon, and you just try to get the business meeting done before the bourbon bottle is empty. And, uh, an inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, obviously you don't have to do it exactly that way, but it's one of those things where you've got to sit down and you've got to talk about budget, you've got to talk about schedule, you got to talk about who's doing what and when, and you might as well uh, do it in a space where you can light up a big fat stogie and pour yourself a, a bourbon and enjoy it with some ACDC in the background. So. <clears throat> Honestly, I can't keep track of everything that's happening at the Quill, uh, which is why I'm hoping to build an event system in April so I can finally see what's going on at the Quill. Um, we don't have the energy to, to play cruise director and put things together ourselves, obviously, because there's only two of us, um, and we're involved in a million projects. Uh, so we try to encourage the members to put together their own events. Uh, we specifically incentivize members to host special events on Friday nights with club credit. Um, so that can range from karaoke and poker to improv comedy jam or all kinds of things. Um, we have five rooms. One room has a 1080p projector and massive, massive bookshelves. Um, another one is a smoking lounge. Um, and we've got an awesome sound system. We've got a full-size poker table. So there's plenty to do and there could be lots of things happening at the same time. We have, generally speaking, um, Access is limited to the paying members, and members are allowed to bring up to two guests with them. So as long as an event has at least one third representation with paying members, pretty much any event can happen, and almost anyone who wants to can get in. Um, activism specific events are, are, the normal rules are waived. So for example, the FSP Doers group meets there every week, um, and it doesn't matter who's a member, because it's, a, it's an open access activism meeting. There's lots of that happening, probably three or four every week. Um, we, the one event we do host is the New Mover Party, which is on the first Tuesday of every month. 
um, outdoors when it's good weather, indoors when it's not. Uh, there's free food, and we just encourage everyone who's come here recently to show up and network and, and meet all these people. So that's been going really well. We tend to have like between half a dozen to a dozen new faces every month, continuously for like the last year, even in the winter months, which has been a fairly new phenomenon this year. Um, yeah, just all kinds of stuff. Isn't it? Great. So typical week of the Praxium. Um, throughout the week, you're going to have people coming in, you know, co-working, um, working on projects together separately. I've got my uh, two full-time guys that come in and work with me. Um, on Monday nights, uh, we, we every other week we're doing uh, Austrian economics group uh, where uh, Andrew Cashone and Mike Valchik are actually tackling Austrian economics on a graduate level. So we read papers, discuss them. It's pretty pretty intense even for me. Um, on uh, on Tuesday nights uh, we have Anarcraft where. Um, the mostly ladies get together and uh, work on different craft projects, um, uh, and that's been that's been a huge success. Um, one of our members has started a support group for uh, parents of homeschool teenagers, and this this extends well beyond our own circle. We've got several homeschoolers, but this is she's got the whole homeschool network on the seacoast. And a lot of people, when they get to that teenage level, they have trouble uh, as as the kids start to you know pull away and become more independent. So just basically a support group where they can all share their strategies and sorrows and so on. Um, and actually, on Tuesday uh, Tuesday mornings, uh, Darren Tapp comes in uh, for the beginning of what I hope will be a whole curriculum of sort of subscriber-based classes for homeschoolers. So he teaches. Uh, his arithmetical playground. It's gone through a few names, but it was recently featured by uh, Ron Paul's Voices of Liberty, uh, which is excellent. These kids are just love it, and they go home and do math for fun. Uh, so a lot of stuff. And then we, you know, we'll do periodic parties and stuff. So uh, yeah, there's all sorts of stuff going on. Um, I, I've got tons of questions, but we're running low on time. So I'd like to turn it over to the audience. Do you guys have anything, or if you don't, I'll just keep going. <laughs> I like what uh, Ofer was kind of describing the space itself, the different rooms. Uh, so at the Keen Activist Center, there's a fairly large porch which can hold a lot of people.